Hello and welcome to Boom Room. You're about to watch an exclusive interview with Keith Dawson, the founder and CEO of Qualu. Qualu is a company building a decentralized network of diagnostic devices that will improve internet connectivity for all. Their network maps the global internet, helps them understand traffic bottlenecks, and allows them to work with both internet service providers and telecommunications companies to improve their existing infrastructure. Full disclosure, Arcanum Ventures is both advising and invested in Qualu. We wanted to bring Keith on board to talk about his past experience, the technology that he's building, and why we all believe it will be so impactful in this space. And now the interview. Enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to another exclusive Boom Room interview. This is Sasha with Arcana Ventures. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Carmelo. Hello, Today, hello. we are interviewing Keith Dawson, the founder and CEO of Qualu. Keith, hello. hello. Good morning. Hello. How are you? Thanks, guys. Yeah, great to be here. Finally get around to recording this. <laughs> yeah, to. right. It's, it's been a long time on the books and uh, very exciting for us. And so... I think, uh, as our view viewers might know by now, uh, you know, we're on board uh, the advisory panel for Qualu. We built the token economy for Qualu. We've been advising you guys for a while now, almost a year. And yeah, I have almost. to say Qualu is like maybe one of the most uh, exciting projects that we've worked with. And one yeah. of the cooler things is really watching you and your co-founder, Nick, and the team's development over the past year, just seeing how you guys have grown, how you've become so resourceful and problem solved your way through really, really big challenges in this journey. But before we get into that, I want to ask you something that we ask all of the, the founders and, and the individuals that we bring on board here. How did this start? How did you get into crypto? How And how did that lead yeah. you to follow? Well, it's been a, a long journey, a long time coming, I think. You know, back in the ICO summer, was it 2017, when every, everything first started? I mean, that's when I got into crypto and um, that's when I kind of had the idea for what we're doing now. You know, I've been always working as a, as a telecom consultant and through that, um, through those projects, I've developed this tool, these tools to help me do the job. You know, we've helped to diagnose the root causes of internet issues, right? And uh, it's always hard when you're a consultant, you go in, you've got like two months to figure out what the hell's going on. And, you know, the data they give you is never good enough, you know? So we kind of, I've always used these kind of devices that we put in customers' homes, which now, you know, we call deep in, you know? Um, but it was on a much smaller scale. So I had this idea of like, you know, we need to make this big, we need it everywhere. We can't just do it on a project by project basis because the problems are everywhere, you know, and then being into crypto, putting it together, you know, to have this big grand idea of we could build a global network and pay people rewards, incentives for running devices, we could fund and grow the network that we couldn't do, you know, so that I kind of wrote the concept paper back in 2017. It was just sat on the shelf, you know, going about my day-to-day -day consultancy projects, you know, and it was really kind of during COVID, during the lockdowns, you know, everyone, it suddenly was on everyone's uh, attention, right? The internet sucks, this digital divide, people can't work from home and all the governments were like wanting to spend money, but they didn't know how to do it, right? And I was like, hey, I've got the blueprint here, time to dust it off the shelf and make it a reality. And, um, you know, and then it's kind of since then it's a bit of a journey thinking well how the hell do we do we do this you know, <laughs> you know like who do we need to speak to and how how do we make it happen you know and like uh, like you say like nick our core finder was a, was a cheerleader saying look this is too big an idea to to fade right we've got we've got to do this right the time is now so we started rallying around colleagues you know friends in the industry trying to just put the pieces together and uh, i think it kind of it was last year when we really started to focus and you know we, we did an accelerator program with in mind where we met you guys and that was kind of like moving from okay we're telecoms consultants with an idea to how do we you know hammer this into something that looks like uh, like a blockchain crypto web3 project and, and merge the two together mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, through after that, meeting you guys and just getting more people in this industry who've got the tools and the skills that, that we don't have to form the team and grow it. And, 
you know, make it a reality. And it's, you know, it's amazing to see, you know, more people joining the team, big hitters and get everyone getting excited. And, um, you know, we just, and that kind of brings us to where we are now, you know, this narrative and everything just falling into our lap perfectly just as we're getting things moving. So <laughs> exciting, exciting times. <laughs> and, and so just, if you don't mind, for people that might not be 100% familiar with what Qualu is, I'm sure, you know, by now they might yeah. have some strong understanding, but give us the one minute spiel. Like, what is Qualu? What does it yeah. do? And how does it do it? Well, I mean, the, the, the big idea is everybody is frustrated when your internet doesn't work and, you know, your internet's got a problem. And that's become a bigger problem every day, you know. Everything, everything moves digital into the cloud. You know, we're completely reliant on that. And Qualu is is a is a network. It's a it's a deep in network, which is the decentralized infrastructure of devices and data that's provided by the community. And we build in a network that's basically like a side chain to the entire internet to make sure internet works well everywhere for everyone. And that deals with a lot of different challenges around, you know, censorship and performance and uh, making sure investment and basically optimizing what we have, investing where we need it and working with every stakeholder. So instead of just a, what we used to do on a consultancy project, we work with one provider. The data's closed, everything's closed. You can't go around and say to another provider, hey, we found a problem with your network. And that's really restrictive because the internet is you know, it's massive, you know, no one entity can, can solve it. So it's really a, a solution to, to solve all those problems and make sure everyone, wherever they are on the planet, gets awesome internet. Amazing. I'm still, I've been wanting to ask this forever, but I'm still astounded. This is such a good idea. Are you shocked, like I am, that nobody's thought of this before? Yeah, absolutely. No. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is kind of also how the idea come about, because when you're working inside the telecommunications industry, right, the barriers and the layers of, of kind of, um, you know, everyone's working in silo. Nobody can really communicate outside. Everyone's working in their own little department. And, and most of the, the, the kind of the industry players and, and the kind of monitoring solutions to date, they're just trying to fit inside that paradigm of, hey, we're going to sell to this provider. And, and you know, so it took, took a big kind of leap to think, no, we do it. Like, why are we just focusing on one tiny bit? We need to look at everything. And, it, and the kind of principles are the same. So instead of me being a consultant for this country or this provider, now I'm a consultant for planet Earth, right? It's the same methodology. We're just thinking bigger. And, um, you know, rather than one provider sort of paying a really high expensive cost up front for consultants and systems and licenses, we get that network to be built by the people. But that also comes with, you know, transparency for the industry, you know, accountability, which there isn't any currently, you know, so it's um, so it's quite a just transformative model and just a, a different way of thinking of things. And you know, that the sort of the accelerations in web three and blockchain and all these kind of new solutions, like that makes this possible. You know, we can build decentralized systems, we can create incentives. We don't need to, you know, rely on kind of these big centralized um, tech companies that want to control things and don't want to necessarily think, uh, you know, release things. And they've all got, um, you know, internal KPIs and, and all this kind of stuff they need to meet to, which just creates added barriers to uh, to us getting the best service, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a bit like going to the doctor and you have a problem with your <laughs> elbow and you know, yeah. not worrying about how that elbow connects to any other part of your body and just saying, no, focus only on this part. So it's interesting that you mentioned yeah. that. Like that. A lot, yeah. I mean, if you think of that, like that most of the doctors, they just mask the symptoms, right? They don't really cover the root cause. And, <laughs> you, know, you know, and that's like, we don't just want to give people temporary pain release. We want to fix the root cause of the problems, you know, first time and instantly, you know. So that kind of, you know, when we used to do this, on the consultancy setup, it was a really long drawn out process, right? You know, like the problems would have to build up so much that, you know, the shareholders, CEOs, everyone, customers leaving gets so annoyed. They throw millions of dollars at consultants and, you know, that can take years, but, you know, the, we need this value all the time. 
And also, you know, we don't just want this value to be for telcos. You know, we want to get this um, out to small businesses, typical end users that that don't really understand too much the technical reasons, but we can make kind of that, what we did on a consultancy, like scalable using this network and AI and all these other cool um, technologies we have now to, to, to really make that value scalable, which gives us more volume and, uh, you know, cover the whole planet. Yeah. You know, um, you, you've spoken to us in the past about some uh, case studies and, and previous sort of like collaborations and engagements that you guys have had, not only with um, telcos or ISPs, but also governments. And uh, the, the thing yeah. that kind of stood out in my mind really helped illustrate the power of what you're doing with Qualu and your decentralized physical infrastructure network is um, solving problems that seem to be caused in like a particular tele telecom network by like some external party. And I think you mentioned there was one case in uh, in Southeast Asia where, uh, you know, no, it's been it had been ongoing for years. And the only reason that you were able to solve it is because you were able to distribute this network that analyzed data across the entire region to help identify the issue and then solve it. And so, like, how important is that in seeing the bigger picture versus what exists now? Because a lot of these ISPs and telcos are competing businesses, right? And they have no incentive to share data. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's interesting because they're all reliant on each other. And it goes back to that kind of paradigm shift of, you know, all telecoms networks when you were just they connected the cable and it was a voice call, right? But now we've run all of this data and infrastructure over it and it no longer becomes a local call. It's now everything's a global call, right? So, I mean, just, you know, when we're talking now, you know, I'm in, I'm in uh, Brunei, you're in, you know, Vietnam and all over the world, right? Where tra this traffic is going through, you know, different countries, different ISPs, different submarine cables and any problem anywhere can can cause an issue and that's kind of like where where the problem is these providers like they just typically just look internally right you know is this box on and, and things like that and you know and because like all the regulations is around that then that's the only thing they really care about right but as end users it's like hey i want to skype my mom on the other side of the planet i want to play a game online and it's it's a global thing and that's basically what we do we basically test not just like you know like a local bandwidth it's like how can this traffic route all around the world to all these major connection points and because we do that regularly we're looking for mapping and identifying any drops of, of service and, and where, where it's coming from and you know so we have that bird's eye view of the planet and what these providers don't have you know and it's from the actual true customer head so it's you know through, through the eyes of the customer it's what they see and so that's you know that, that's what gives us the power to uh, identify these issues and you know any drops in service should be investigated right they come from a problem whereas you know another problem with the industry is they all have these kpis and slas and have these buffers and it's all averages you know so it's one percent data loss you know, but then they average it over a month and then it comes to zero, you know, so you can have a situation where, you know, on a night you totally can't use the internet, but when they see their average reports, everything looks green, right? So nothing no gets way. done about it. There's no, it's no attention, you know, so I like to say that we put attention where it's needed, you know, for far less overhead of like, you know, the traditional ways of doing things. And I guess the other big difference is like what we've, Build compared to others is there's a lot of companies that just focus on like a benchmark, you know, like a high level, um, these averages like we, we talk about, whereas we've built this system up over like 15 years, the methodology, how we can use the data to actually solve the problem because that was our job, right? You know, we're, we're in there as consultants, we've got to instantly identify the problem. Um, so we've kind of geared everything up to that way. And uh, yeah. so that, that's, that's been really helpful as well i, I want to ask you really quick in the in the spirit of like forcing the change um it makes a lot of sense like you know i'm right now i'm in poland and we're having a conversation halfway across the world and it the the data needs to go through all these different checkpoints this pipeline right 
based on your experience, like which country is the worst? Like who needs to step their game up? Let's call them oh, out. Wow. Germany. <laughs> wow. Germany's awful, man. Well, it's, I mean, it's horrible. It's, it's, um, it's amazing to think that uh, we have so many problems, you know, like even in, you know, the, the kind of developed world, you can still have periods of bad internet. But I mean, obviously the emerging markets, Africa, Asia, you've got this explosion in digitization, everyone's got a phone, e-payments and stuff like that. And then the connectivity is the bottleneck, right? You know, so, um, and it's quite interesting. I mean, being in crypto, we go to these events and we hear all these buzzwords, right? You've got to bank the unbanked and all this kind of stuff. And now we can't do anything if they're not connected, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so um, you know, so that, I mean, that's a big kind of part of our strategy, right? To help these emerging um, markets to uplift what they've got currently, target the investment where it's needed, and work with the partners across across those regions. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did want to. I did want to ask you about. There's there's so much to talk about here, and and there's so many <laughs> things to get excited about. Um, and I'm wondering if we can really hit them all. But one one thing that I remember um, really blew me and Carmelo's minds was when we were building the token economy, a lot of what we do, and I'm sure you understand this very well by now, um, yeah. when we're designing a token economy, we're performing uh, the modeling, we're creating the concept, et cetera. It's not just tokens that we're looking at, right? We're looking at essentially the entire business and the entire financial picture of what the business will do. And that includes tokens, it includes actual fiat or stable coin financial projections, et cetera. And, and the numbers are kind of astounding for us. And I remember when we were trying to figure out, you know, what is a sensible business development strategy for deploying this network globally? Um, it's something that really stood out to me because when you compare this D-PIN project against other D-PIN projects, for example, I think the majority of other D-PIN projects are, let's say, um, like kind of hardware deployment networks that are trying to create like some satellite internet connectivity or capability in um, impoverished regions, which is very expensive and it's, it's very difficult to do and it's very difficult to maintain, right? Because there are so many gaps in coverage and th that needs to scale endlessly. Like you, that, that network benefits from deploying a billion or like unlimited number of devices. Whereas Qualu on the other hand, I remember you told me like you can cover an entire a a country on average with four to 500 devices. You get a complete picture of their entire internet infrastructure and traffic. And very quickly we saw this can, this can cover the world's internet traffic and, and map the entire global internet for a very, very affordable cost, which is crazy considering that no one's done it. And it eventually will happen. And so what do you kind of see around like the future of, of mapping that global internet? Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, it does sound almost unrealistic when you say the kind of the low numbers of devices that you use. And, you know, typically when we did these audits in the past, we weren't using thousands of devices. You know, sometimes it was 10 or 20 devices, right? And um, you can think of it like... Um, you know, imagine a, a road, motorway, a city, and you're sending one car out to 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 drive a route and they find a traffic jam. You only need that one car to report back and say, found a traffic jam, right? And you see that quite effectively on like Google Maps, Waze, when you open your map and you see the red areas and stuff, stuff like that. So, and the other thing is like with these internet providers, like no matter how many millions of customers you have, they all just like the roots of a tree that come into a trunk and then they've only got a handful of branches that go out to the network. So if you've got quite a modest sample size of mobile nodes mapping and the fixed nodes mapping, you can paint quite a big picture of um, exactly where the traffic's been rooted, where the problems are. And, you know, that kind of view is like, you know, we're kind of like the ways for the internet, right? We're mapping those kind of congestion points. We want to identify and we want to, you know, let, the key players know in real time where these issues are. Um, and I mean, the other thing is like, there is no map of the internet, right? You know, you see these submarine cable maps where there's connections, but there's no actual map of 
the, the, the kind of the, uh, the logical routing and mapping between the different countries. And, you know, and some of the data that we've got, we've got like providers that are next to each other and they've got hundreds of milliseconds difference routing to different regions, right? And, you know, you've probably read in the past, like, you know, a lot of like these latency sensitive businesses, they spend millions of dollars to lay new submarine cables to save a few milliseconds off. But if it's not configured right, you can lose 200 milliseconds, right? So one part of the map we're doing is all of these routes around the world with different regions, finding the optimal path and then showing these to other to our subscribers, right? These providers will access this map and they say, you know, why is it taking you 500 milliseconds to get to South America from Asia when it's only taking 300 for these? So they use the same intelligence and can save 200 milliseconds off the route, you know, and it's just by doing things smarter, right? And which is always like, you know, that's what this data, big data analytics has given us, you know, the, the power to kind of see patterns in data, and make better decisions. And, you know, that can have huge impacts. And um, especially when, you know, those kind of issues that exist, you know, with, with a provider, you can have one or two problems inside the provider's network and it can affect millions of customers, right? So you imagine uh, ringing the help desk and my internet's dropping, but they're all ringing at different times. Nobody knows where it is. You've got to send a technician. They get fed up. They change the modem. They just It's just trial and error, you know, and that, that's part of the, um, the problem as well. It's like there's so much money leaked from them just not understanding what's going on. And that means there's so much re- um, OPEX and other thing, benefits we can save them just by giving them the picture of what's going on. And that's where the value comes in. And, um, you know, having that network that's always on powered by the people means, like, this value is always there, you know, for anyone who needs it. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, you reminded me before. Uh, I wanted to ask, when we first spoke to you, I thought, the, the first thought that probably came to Sasha in my, my head was, are you worried that any internet or telco company would figure this out and start to deploy something like this? But uh, do you believe that's even possible without an economic layer, without a token? This needs to be decentralized. So I think that's... Yeah. In a weird way, it's like your biggest yeah. de- defensive moat against, uh, you know, potential competitors. Yeah, I mean, it, these barriers that exist in the industry, you know, they, they can, a lot of them are built, you know, on purpose. And a lot of them are sort of built by just the systemic hierarchy of how things are done. And, um, yeah, I mean, to instead of focusing, like, solely on we're a provider solution, right? We're, we're for the people, right? You know, the, the, the internet is, you know, doesn't even exist if you think of it. It's just a concept of, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, in reality, it's just, you know, interconnected networks. But for the people, the internet is much more, right? It means we, we can connect to anyone else, any place, any time around the world. And that's what we think the internet is, right? And, you know, and that ha- being decentralized means that we can do a lot of, different um, use cases from from the same kind of um, network, you know, so it's not performance monitoring and diagnosing these issues in real time is one, but, you know, having, making sure the internet's like um, not got censorship, that they're not throttling traffic and, and all that kind of stuff is just as important. And um, that's something that needs to be owned by the people, not belonging to any one big tech organization or big uh, um, or government or anything like that. So the, the, the token and, and decentralized way is such a key part of getting that, that layer built because you you couldn't do it by any other means, right? Because everyone, like one telco has only got a small boundary, right? Even if they've got presences in multiple countries, you can't ask them to pay for a global network when it's got nothing to do with them. So um, so this so the, the, the token economy was always the, the, the way to give us that service layer. Um, and, and, and this kind, you know, the deep in narrative where, I mean, we didn't know what to call it over these years, but now everyone's just like deep in, <laughs> but I mean, we are probably one of the truest forms of deep in, you know, I know everyone's kind of just jumping on the, the bandwagon now, but you know, we're a deep in network that's powered by the people to make sure that we, we all have, uh, you know, we're all connected and work on that together. Yeah, you just brought up. Uh, sorry, I, I have uh, two questions that you just reminded me of too. And the first one is stupid, but I've always wanted to ask somebody in the know, and you absolutely are, because Sasha and I, we we live in Vietnam for part of the year, 
And when I first moved there, we had severe internet outages, and all of the locals would tell me that it stemmed from sharks eating underwater fiber optic cables leading to the city. And I was yeah. never sure. There was theories that it was like sabotage from a foreign uh, government or, you know, but the shark one always stuck with me. And I, is that even possible? And if so, why, why is fiber yeah. optic data so delicious to sharks? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's all. I mean, they're always getting snapped, right? You know, the the boats go through them. You know, yeah. when they're laying cables, you know, sharks and all kinds of stuff. And you know, it's amazing they're not properly buried; they're just kind of thrown down there on the bottom of the the ocean floor. And um, so, I mean, that they're, they're always going to be cable breaks. But the problem goes is like when there's a break in, like a, one cable goes down, the provider loses a lot of capacity, right? So the traffic has got to go along the other routes, you know, just like when a road is closed on a highway and everyone diverts and things. And if and it just goes down to planning, right? You know, they, they need to, uh, you know, make sure they've got proper redundancy of these different routes. But the other thing is um, the kind of the, the internal processes that the networks need for routing traffic. It's not a kind of automated process, you know, when they're balancing traffic and things like that. So when a link goes down, they need to jump in and manage it a bit, and they don't, you know, and that is a technical gap that a lot of these providers don't have, right? And that that sort of extends the problems as well, and and it's so slow to fix these cables that can be months, you know, to get repaired, and you know, so you, you do need to, um, you know, plan better and things like that, and you know, that's also some of the kind of things that we look out for in our data is like, you know, when there's disturbances, like how can you you know, build better redundancy? How can you invest in areas where there's uh, these disturbances are common, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah, that, that also reminds me, there was one place, I can't mention where, but one island I was living on there, there was an instance where the military came in for training exercises and they smashed the underwater power and internet connection with the anchor. And only a vessel of that size, with an anchor of that size could have done that but they, yeah. they blamed the local fishing boat that had a tiny anchor. It was physically impossible for it yeah. to do that. I'm sure they didn't want to pay for the insurance uh, cost because it could be like 30, 20, 30 million dollars of uh, cost or something when you repair them. So, I mean, it is a big business, like when these cables get cut, actually tracking who cut it. And, and they've got like uh, satellite monitoring, ship lane tracking, and trying to upload, uh, you know, pinpoint who did it and hit them with a huge uh, bill. You know, I got completely oh. derailed from the shark thing. Uh, I forgot my question. Go no, no, I, I, just the, the second serious question, the not shark tasty internet question, but uh, this brings up a good point too, because you mentioned censorship before, and then we're talking about working with governments. So is there how can you deal with governments? Because you've already worked with a few governments, like before Kuala was officially born. How can right. you work with governments and remain neutral without like drawing the ire of governments? Because you're you're obviously going to be helping them connect with yeah. other countries, other ne other networks. So how can you do that and, and remain completely neutral without you know angering or upsetting them or breaking their censorship? Yeah, well, tough question that one. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think. Um, well, I mean, I think that I mean, there's a couple of things to look at. I mean, what would it, one with a censorship is like it's kind of like lip service that they do, right? Because it's so easily bypassed with VPNs and stuff like that. So it's almost like, True. you know. But the, I mean, the, I mean, the big thing that we're doing is like these governments have a really tough time, right? To to get their citizens connected, right? And because they, you know, the, when they're not connected, they lose a lot of money, right? You know, the, the GDP, there's so much to pay for in doing that. And um, also like, I mean, most of the regulators, they don't have huge budgets. They don't have technical um, skills. The, most, the, in most of them, they even ask the telcos to just self-report their uh, performance, you know? So, um, you know, so we're really approaching this from like, a we're building this network because it's it's necessary. You know, it's it is for public good, and there is a lot of benefits that they will get out of it. And those benefits, uh, you know, far outweigh any kind of um, you know censorship issues they might have and things like that. And then on the kind of the censorship side, we're looking at looking at like using the network to confirm if certain types of services 
are blocked in certain regions and cer certain types of applications are being throttled from certain locations and things like that, which is, you know, then it becomes a, a, a debate, right, you know, on the international scene, right? We've, you know, we're working with different kind of multinational organizations, like uh, we did a project with ASEAN on their quality of experience framework and worked with some governments in, in Asia and stuff around that. And, you know, we're very much focusing on look, this, this is needed it's for the public good. We need to get everyone connected and look at how much extra money you're going to make and look at the, the quality of life you're going to improve. And you're going to spend much less money because you're going to be, instead of investing billions randomly, you can invest it much more efficiently and get better, more bang for your buck kind of thing in the investment. Yeah, you know, um, you mentioned some crazy numbers before, Keith, and <laughs> it's it's interesting how this kind of works, right? Because the ISP telco industry, uh, to some extent, is becoming commoditized, which means that it's, you know, something that is necessary and used by all, in a sense. Yeah. And, um, and all of a sudden, when you have like a necessity driving the equation, then, you know, you have like a very, very guaranteed revenue stream and a very strong business model and and what the, the impact that qualu can have on a global scale is so strong but the scary thing is that you're potentially dealing with a lot of large companies that have massive bankrolls they have a lot of money to throw around and so what are the risks of something like this breaking in the sense that you know uh someone offers you a massive check to just purchase it and then improve their network to in comparison to some of their competitors. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to a company, a private company owning this infrastructure. And then even once they benefit from it, kind of, um, you know, offering it as a service in the same way that Qualu would to some of their other competitors at a massive premium. Yeah, I mean, and you, you also see, you know, some kind of big companies in the kind of internet monitoring space have been bought out by big entities like Cisco, you know, for billions of dollars. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that is obviously one, one thing, but you know, there's also like, the, we, we're doing this for the need of the people, right? So it would be a bit of a sellout if we just give it to <laughs> one organization. And the thing is, it's like um, the payoff is more than enough with the different use cases and the global volume of that it can be put to use for to, 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 to it be like a pure monetary thing. So I think we've got to sort of like stick to our morals and think like, let's just let this exist for the people. And, uh, you know, I mean, and the other thing is like, you know, we're, all of these telcos, they can all have their own internal systems and everything. It's, it's great. You know, we're just like an add on to all of that. Right. We don't, you know, I mean, another important thing is like, we don't need any permission by any telco to do this monitoring, right? We, and, and testing and things. We also don't need to put any equipment inside the telecoms network, you know? So it's like, as soon as you plug a node at home or you run in our app and you're mapping the internet, like we get like ridiculous insights about exactly how that network's set up, what works, what doesn't work, when the problems happen and stuff like that. And, you know, we've spent, the last 15 years fixing those issues you know so we can we can we can bring that that uh, volume and i mean the other thing is like the, like we've touched on before is like the internet is so fragmented it's tens of thousands of like providers that put together and you know, god knows how many application providers you know like you think the big over the top streaming providers and cloud providers everyone's relying on the infrastructure the underlying infrastructure making sure that works and, you know, it's just too big to just give to any one entity, right? It's got to be uh, kept open and uh, available. And, you know, we, and our connectivity is too important to leave it to any one entity, right? Or any one provider. So, so we need this open transparency to make sure that it works everywhere and just fight, mm. fight against those kind of ulterior motives that these telcos that are for profit and don't want to put, you know, spend the money in these rural areas and stuff. So we need, we need to keep that open. You're, you're like the Batman of the internet. I want to, I want to, yeah, um, the Avengers, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I want, I want our viewers to understand a little bit more about what that means. Um, logistically for them, like on the user front, right? You're talking about putting devices in people's homes 
people yeah. installing an application on their mobile phone or even, you know, their smart fridge, for example. And so give us an idea of how this works. Like what kind of data is being collected? Is it is it sensitive data? Is it consuming a lot of power? Is it consuming a lot of data? Is it, you know, how is it uh, handled and aggregated and analyzed? Yeah, so the, so the idea is like we do not look at any customer traffic at all, right? So the, the nodes basically act autonomously. They generate their own traffic. They send it out around the internet. Um, they, they analyze things like the, the connectivity layer, like, you know, what, how's your Wi-Fi network? How's your mobile network? Um, but then how's the underlying internet network you know how how's all the roads out of the country and stuff performing and then also the access like the more application layer the, how popular apps and services are performing and we, we bring all that together and you know essentially it's kind of like you can think of like most people understand like the mapping concept where they can um, you know they map they help map you know there's a few deep in projects that are mapping uh, like the network the the roads like hive mapper and things like that like we're mapping connectivity, right? And, you know, so from all over the world, across all of the different layers, right? So not only are we mapping, you know, how the connectivity is at other locations, we want to know how that connectivity is performing from every location around to all the other locations. So we're, we're mapping, we're detecting issues, and, 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 you know, I guess like the other side of things is we're building this global connectivity map which is kind of like going to be like Google Maps for connectivity, right? Not only is it going to have all your Wi-Fi's and stuff like you, when you check into a hotel, you can check in on the Qualo app. It's going to not only check the local performance, it's going to do that deep audit analysis that we would do. We're going to score these providers and areas. So then, then you can basically ask our data, you know, like which hotel's got the best internet in Bangkok or I'm traveling to Vietnam, which SIM card shall I use, right? So all of that kind of consumer level data that can be used on top and then underneath all of that really rich insights that's like a literal gold mine for providers we take care of that and, and set up all of the the information share and apis and that with with telco to to basically you know remove those barriers and then given a good service right so it's um it's going to serve both both kind of uses so we're a bit like um a trust pilot for the internet as well, you know, using this data, you know, so whether you want to know which is the best provider to use for gaming or for business, you know, it's going to have that level of, of detail. And then, you know, there's going to be a lot of different ways we can interact with that data, right? And it could be something like um, you're playing an online gaming tournament, you know, what you can use our like all of our data set to see which is the best times to, to, to set up that call or have that gaming tournament. and. You know, there's just so many ways that we we can use the data. It's so powerful. Yeah, you know, I was thinking one of the biggest pieces of feedback we've been getting early, like months ago, less so now, but and and they're warranted absolutely. The first was, were, are people willing to buy devices like nodes and plug them into their home, and, and just run it? perpetuity yeah. basically and you know sasha i was just thinking too because we've been doing a lot of research on node sales right now which are not physical infrastructure they're just nodes in name only and people are paying outlandish fees for the right <laughs> to run a node you know like thousands of dollars for an nft that signifies earnings from a node that you're not actually running and then i was thinking why is it so hard to sell like a, a much cheaper actual physical device that people plug into their home so like that that kind of Rest assured that that's not going to be a big problem. But the second one, which is the biggest piece of feedback, is how can you maintain security and privacy? Because I think a lot of people, uh, especially in the crypto space, because you know we're a naturally skeptical bunch. So how can you sort of assure people that they're safe and plugging this device in their home, that it's not going to be reading any private data or yeah. or, or interfering with anything they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, basically? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the nodes that you can, I mean, they're not connected in line. So there's no traffic flowing through the node. You know, it's just like, you know, your friend coming to your house and asking for your Wi-Fi password or something. You know, mm -hmm. And I mean, we've got dedicated cybersecurity teams that are using that. You know, we're ro rolling out on uh, on uh, IOTEX network, which is just a new bit of information, which, you know, there's a lot of security protocols in there. Um, 
in their tech stack that we're implementing, <laughs> which is uh, why you know, which is one of the reasons why why we uh, you know we chose to launch on that. But you know, these devices as well, you know, we don't need any personal information. You know, you can think of it like you know, we're a side chain to the internet. Our nodes are like stakes in the ground. We want to know roughly where it is. You know, rough. It doesn't need to be exactly a rough location and which network it's provided, it's connected to, right? And you know, and, and to have this decentralized network where you can run tasks and jobs and that and know like that's the that's the kind of the base the way it's been executed that job or that task um, is is the key thing you know and uh, we so we don't need personal information we don't care about any of that kind of stuff we don't want to know which websites you're looking at or that you know whereas it was like some of the kind of the solutions that technology uh, telecom providers use they use like deep packet inspection technology right so it's like a spy box every single packet is analyzed which device is going to where, and they try to you know infer some level of performance from that which is which is flawed you know inherently because one is you have no structure or control over the metrics or, the, or what's testing whereas we're more like we are structured network all nodes perform the same we know exactly how the test data has been run and where it's running. And then that means we can correlate in a structured way and diagnose all of these issues. And the other kind of thing with these uh, deep packet inspection boxes is like when you use encrypted tunnels, like you can't see anything, right? So these providers are relying on seeing this, but as more and more decentralized networks and, and VPNs and tunnels go over, like they, they won't see anything. They'll just see traffic flowing between uh, VPNs kind of thing. Which, um, which then, you know, that makes our kind of insights even more important because we're going to be from the edge, you know, the, I mean, that's part of the, why the kind of rewards are paid to the users as well. It's not so much that they're running a node where they're selling access to their viewpoint of the internet, which is very valuable, especially when you compare that with our analytics, our experience, everything we've sort of learned about fixing networks end to end over the last 15 years and, you know, so, uh, you know, let's dive in a little bit deeper into that, right? At, at the at the foundation, it's a network of nodes, some physical nodes, and then yeah. some mobile nodes, and the mobile node is like an, an application. And then yeah. users that run physical nodes, they can earn cryptocurrency rewards by contributing to this larger network, this larger sort of, yeah. um, you know, initiative of creating like a diagnostics data network that helps yep. you guys improve the internet for everyone. But yeah. at the same time, you guys are working with companies, providing insights, making money, wow. and then providing those rewards. Yeah. What can people do on, uh, like at a, at a user, at a retail investor, at like, I'm an everyday person with like a router in my home. What else can they do with the application? Like what else are you doing with the data that's kind yeah. of focused towards these people? Yeah, so so there's going to be multiple ways to, to use this. I mean, one key function is it's going to be basically like your own consultant in your pocket, like an AI guru looking at you after your connection. So any issues that are detected will say, hey, this is being detected. This is what you need to do or letting you know if the problem's inside your provider or elsewhere. So it's kind of really taking care of that connectivity, right? So there's a obviously there's a big technical gap around that and people don't, necessarily know how to set up Wi-Fi networks and when they need a mesh router and what settings and so all of that is a big thing. And then as you know, as they go around coffee shops, hotels, public, checking into the Wi-Fi, contributing to that map, you know, so they're both adding to the map, using the map, you know, when they want to use that connectivity data. And uh, they get rewards for that as well. And then also for the um, you know benchmarking their services, understanding uh, what's the best service for them? Th those kind of things are on the consumer side. That that's what we're focused on. But the, I mean, the other um, side of that as well, because we've got these you know businesses that will be one on the map, especially those that connectivity is focused, um, like important for them. You know, restaurants, coffee shops, hotels, like for them to offer promotions and, and coupons and all this to get users around the fact that they've got great internet you know so there's a lot of um, things we want to do that on the on the business connectivity side 
And then for, you know, the small size businesses, you know, I mean, connectivity is still, you know, important for about 85% of small businesses, you know, to, for virtually, you know, for a very low cost, having their own telecom consultants sat on their network, letting them know when there's any problems and what they need to do is, uh, you know, it's going to be very, very valuable for them. That's fantastic. The scope is Honestly, endless. Just knowing which places have internet is valuable already. I, I remember I was in Germany yeah. looking for a place to work in Leipzig, and I went to three or four coffee shops, bought a coffee, only to learn that there was no Wi-Fi. So yeah. I was just high on caffeine. Wasn't looking for a place to work. Yeah, I mean, I've added into the app as well, like a, a, a tag. It. You can tag places with no Wi-Fi as well, right? So it's not just checking into a Wi-Fi. If the place don't have Wi-Fi, you can tag them and... And, uh, you know, and do that. And I get, I get way too much enjoyment doing that, right? <laughs> and I go to a place and they say they've got no wife. I'm like, right, you know. <laughs> it's, awesome. it's such a big thing. I think, uh, like, I, I always have internet anxiety when I book, like, an Airbnb or a hotel, especially yeah. since Carmelo and I have started making uh, video content, you know, because we have to have, like, a good connection. And it really kind of, um, you know, gets in the way of the the enjoyment of the video. If all of a sudden one of us is like freezing, yeah, so I have this exactly. massive anxiety. Uh, and you know, it's it's just interesting that like the tools that exist now that are kind of like the benchmark aren't accurate. I use speedtest.net. I'm I'm not. Are you if you're familiar with this? I'm sure. I think, but yeah. like, you know, I check into an Airbnb and it says I have like 150 megabit per second. <laughs> And, you know, I can't even watch like a YouTube short. And so I, I just don't understand, like, what's the difference and why is it yeah. so wrong? I mean, th th this is actually what's contributed to a lot of the problems on the Internet, you know, because the, the default benchmark has been, hey, how much speed test have you got? Right. Whereas like, which is insane because because providers use that as a benchmark and consumers use that as a benchmark, all of the investment is focused on just making the pipe bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And, you know, no one cares how wide the road is, right? When you're going on a journey, you want to know what time am I going to get there, right? So there's no point to just keep making the, 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 the road bigger. And I mean, like on virtually every service provider, the, the speed test server, test two is as close to the customer as possible. So it's like not even going over halfway across the network. So, um, you know, I've got some beautiful charts from some projects we did recently where, you know, the speed test is like 500 meg on the nose and then everything else is just falling apart and it's it's beautiful, right? And that, that goes to show um, and, you know, like speed test, throw awards out, you know, service providers, you know, you know, always putting out new press releases. We're number two in speed tests and you're like, can't use anything. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's that. I mean, there's, you know, there's there's a big kind of change in the industry. People are trying to get more attention to that. It's like you can't just throw investment at the, the last mile connection. You know, and I mean, you probably heard that this most countries are spending billions to roll fiber to the home out, which basically just moves the bottleneck from your house to the exchange, right? And then, and then what? And, uh, you know, so that's a, a big part of what we're kind of exposing and mapping is like, you know, you need to spend money where it's needed, you know? And uh, if someone's got a hundred meg internet connection, they're not going to get any more benefit to go to a gigabit if you don't solve all of your interconnect out and your handling of traffic it's like you know it's, it's wasted money and uh yeah i mean so i mean this part of mapping everything is you know when you actually understand the real situation you can make much better decisions and you know our vision is that qualo will be the the global standard for benchmarking internet and that will drive the coverage maps it will drive the global benchmarking the competitive uh, rankings and everything that's that's where we see it going because it's just so much more effective and useful than everything else, you know. And that was the same when I was working as a consultant. Like you think they've got eight million dollar, ten million dollar network operation center. They've got uh, licenses that bid tens of millions of dollars a year for, and none of that data is useful to really see why the customers are complaining, right? But yeah, we can put these relatively cheap hardware devices in people's homes and test through and look at it a bit differently. And then we can see all of these issues and actually get things changed, you know, because we, you know, I guess putting us outside of those barriers means we have much more, um, you know, visibility and, and ability to, to, to move on things. 
And I guess that's kind of part of the, um, you know, the challenge is going to be is how when we change everyone's mindset to just thinking on the big picture rather than just that internal focus. Because a lot of the times the the providers are the, are the men in the middle, but they're the ones that can actually make changes. They can choose different upstream providers for the share and traffic. They can advise customers, you know, what routers to use or things like that. So um, it's going to be uh, interesting to, to go out that. Are, are you at all, this is so disruptive. Are, are you uh, like afraid for your well-being that overnight you're going to destroy <laughs> this company's yeah. speed test and others like them? You know, like you're talking about completely. Well, I mean, that's, um, yeah, I mean, that's is. like the, the old paradigm versus the new paradigm, right? I mean, those uh, solutions that play into that telco um, that space. But the thing is, like, you can't solve these issues from within telco, right? It's a global problem. It involves more, more, uh, you know, more players, and, and and that's what we're doing it. But I mean, there is. So I mean, if you think telco is very slow to move on anything, right? They've got all these barriers, and you know, they're kind of like put there on purpose to get their vendors in and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, ultimately. We're breaking down those barriers, right? So no more do they need to have expensive procurement exercises that takes six months or a year. They don't need to um, have all these solutions. They've got basically a ready-made network. They don't have to, that provides all those insights. They don't need to send a technician out. They don't need to buy any devices. They don't need any maintenance contracts. They don't need any consultants. They just subscribe to our network. So it's taken all of that logistical overhead that takes years and costs millions of dollars to make it into just a simple SaaS style solution for them. And I mean, some of the kind of issues we've got on case studies is, is, is nuts because I mean, we solve issues and detect issues in minutes or hours when major vendors have spent six months troubleshooting and stuff like that. You know, I mean, it's just crazy, you know, and uh, just from having this network, it's that same value is going to be um, global and the same value is going to be available for everyone whether you're just a, a typical user or a business or, or one of these major telcos right yeah we're not afraid of you speed test no <laughs> you can't hurt us <laughs> speed test speed test i was going to say before it feels no, like the dad watching tv on the couch and the kids trying to show the homework yeah, yeah it looks yeah. good good job <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, the other thing is like, when I go back to it, there's no control over the results. It's like you could run a speed test and you, you know, you're in the back garden or on, clinging to the network or you could, you know, you could be right next to the router and, you know, there's just so many variables and, and the data is a bit kind of swayed because like you don't just open up and run a speed test because you're interested, right? It's like, Nothing's working. What's going on? And the speed test gives you a number, but it doesn't give you anything else, right? You don't know. Is it in my house? Is it in the other side of the world or, or anywhere? You know. So I mean, that's. I mean, I kind of like have the comparison. It's like you know, like Shazam, where it's so easy, you just flick it and you get the song. Like that level of ease, we want to use from the Quali app, right? You know, but it, but it's automated, right? Ping detects the issues in the background, lets you know if you need to do anything. That's the provider, and then so it's then solving two kind of problems. It's by like keeping the kind of customers, users informed of what's going on. It's letting the providers know if they need to do anything. And in a lot of instances, it's changing that kind of mindset from people just hammering um, the providers, saying you know they're rubbish, to you know changing like what would be a fault to a sale or an upgrade. Right. So you imagine how huge that is on, on a kind of global scale. It's 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 massive. That's an interesting thing, too, because you mentioned before that you're going to be able to help telco companies and ISPs like fix, you know, how they do things. But how are you going to help consumers? Because, you know, we have this joke in the U.S., at least, that if the telco company or the cable or Internet company says, yeah, we'll be we'll be here anytime from uh, 8, 8 a.m. tomorrow and, uh, you know, next month, <laughs> and you can never pinpoint when they're going to be home. They're not very helpful. Yeah. Customer service is rubbish. So, like, how uh, yeah, will you be uh, able to tell people like where, where in their home they can get the best reception for their router? Like, uh, how specifically can you help people in their homes like access the internet yeah. better? So, I mean, there's going to be all, all kinds of insights, and I mean, it's 
it'll be detecting things like how much time you're spending in a weak Wi-Fi zone, which of, as you're connecting to different Wi-Fi's, which one's the best. Um, you know, we want, I mean, we can't talk too much about this yet, but we've got sort of partnerships in the pipeline where we have hardware solutions where you can buy it on the app. You know, if you need a Wi-Fi extender or mesh router, like you can buy a pre-approved one that's optimized and we know it's going to be awesome. You know, so basically we're bringing the, the solution and the, to the problem, you know, as well. And, um, you know, we're, one, the telcos have this data set at their disposal, right? They're, they're going to have so much more time on their hands. They're not going to be rushing around firefighting, right? You know, you solve the root cause and uh, you make sure it's confirmed, right? So you, uh, whereas now it's just literally the wild west, right? People just, technicians come on all the time. The first thing they do is change your router. So there's another hundred dollars down the drain. If they come back, they change the router again, and they change like every, every time they go poking about in the network, they put more faults on, right? So it's that's always been the case. Yeah. Talking about, oh, go ahead, sir. I was going to say talking about like saving millions to billions of dollars globally in inefficiencies, right? And and I, I wanted to kind of cover the numbers a little bit more, like talk about traction and, and what you guys have done. And because again, like when we've been working together for a while and this the funny thing is like we learn something new every time we talk mm -hmm. and we just and we we just do not cease to be impressed and amazed by all of this information that we're consuming on like a weekly basis where we're speaking and so like on you know on some of the other uh case case studies and and um you know let's say like projects that you guys have come on board from the numbers blew our minds so like give us an example of of like maybe one time that Qualu, um, you know, worked with some government or agency in yeah. solving a big problem, like, and, and how much did that save them and how much did it cost yeah. you guys, how much time and stuff? Yeah, I mean, we recently did a, an, like an audit project in Brunei. I mean, it's quite a small country, but we, I mean, this was off the back of like years of complaints by the, the customers, social media were getting hammered, problems were getting worse. So we were speaking to the regulator to do, um, a project, right? And we used like, we probably deployed less than 20 devices by the time we, we sort of like seen these these issues that were caused, like impacting the entire country, right? And when we looked at the data, it was impacting like, you know, the, the major banks in Brunei, the, the Royal Brunei Airlines, the, uh, um, nobody could use, um, you know, like major games, like without connecting a VPN. And it was basically all because someone had missed one line of code from a router <laughs> and years of chaos. Right. And, you know, we picked, put it out, we mapped it, we seen the issues, we detected it. We, we give all the information to the provider and they fixed it. Right. But I mean, like you think of like how much that adds up, right? Outages, businesses not being able to connect, you know, when, when you look at the kind of, I mean, there's loads of studies that are out there, like saying like, um, you know, for every second of, um, your website longer takes takes to load longer. You lose X percent of uh, buyers and businesses and costs and stuff like. When you are, it's, it's millions of dollars of impacts economically, right, for a country. You know, and that's where we go in. Like, we're stabilizing countries. You know, not just local, not just your house. We're looking at entire national infrastructure, right? And then, you know, and then regional stuff that that's going on, right? So, I mean, when you get to to bigger providers, like, you know, I mean. I mean, there's some of the numbers are crazy. You know, like it's could you, you could see fifty million dollars savings just by picking up a few of these issues and solving the root causes, rather than just letting everyone have at it with um, seven technicians and all the churn and all that stuff. And I mean, you think of not just the kind of the monetary value for these um, providers, but the environmental for the world as well. Like these truck rolls, these engineers, these e-waste routers just randomly change. Like, and when you multiply that by every country on the earth, it's like the numbers are insane. It's all, it's almost like sounds made up, you know, but it's just, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit of a concept, like the blind leading the blind in telco and uh, no one knows what's going on. And, you know, and it's that, that's just why, I mean, like let's go back to those audits, like our data from these devices was the only data we could rely on. I mean, like everything else was, was junk, you know, and, um, 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's why we always said, like, look, we need to do this everywhere. Like, how can we do it? How can we make this, like, available to everyone? Man, and you, you mentioned, like, in that specific example, 20 devices, right? And then um, you, you mentioned before, like, you saw the problem almost immediately. Uh, yeah. And so, like, I, I don't know if you guys, I don't think you guys started officially selling the devices yet. You, when I met you guys in person, you gave me some. And I've been yeah. like secretly stashing them at like friends' houses and stuff, like yeah. just connecting them to their routers. But yeah. um, you know, yeah. like they don't, they don't, they're not big devices, and they don't seem very complex hardware. Like the majority of wow, the value yeah. comes from the data analytics. But like, how much do you anticipate, like it, it you know, it, some of these devices might sell for once you start selling them? Well, yeah, I mean, we want to keep the devices as cheap as possible because the value comes from the coverage, not from our node sales. And the other thing is like the huge target regions that we're going after, especially with this view for public good and helping the internet in these uh, urban rural areas and things like that. It's like we need to keep the costs as low as possible, but I mean, it's going to be sub one hundred dollars regardless. And that we've also talked about subsidizing the rollout and i know we we looked at this in the tokenomics and things like that it's like you know crazy numbers like with with like a twenty thousand dollar a month subsidy we could cover the planet in like a year or something and uh it's crazy. it's um it's amazing it, it just goes back to that concept you know that mapping if you can send one car out on the road and find a traffic jam you don't need to send ten thousand cars that would create a traffic jam you know and um so the other thing was as the nodes increase you you get to see more regional problems you get to see more um um you know more issues with like the, the lower local areas and things like that but the, the major issues the systemic issues of like maybe in a telco is like not configured properly there's underlying issues um you can detect them with quite a low number of devices so well yeah you mentioned before too, like, so one of my favorite things about this is that you said before the D pin sort of fell in your lap. And this is one of the few projects that actually needs decentralization. It actually is D pin and it actually uses AI and, and it's not just a, a fake AI plug it into the pitch deck and hope that VCs are dazzled by artificial intelligence mention. <laughs> <laughs> but so how, how yeah. do you plan to use like AI specifically? Are you working with any? Yeah. AI layers or, or projects to uh, share data? Yep. Well, we, we just um, doing a partnership with Amada Network, actually, who's like, uh, they're building an AI layer two. They've been really awesome in helping us out and they've got some really top AI guys who are gonna help us build the models and then we're gonna be able to run that on their infrastructure, right? Which is also really cool. Now, I mean, the, so the, the AI use cases is like basically like, how do we take something what we did on a consultancy layer before and make it scalable. How can they make all of that value scalable? And you, you know, you can use these like AI and machine learning to do like the fingerprinting of issues, um, your correlation across the network. And then also like the, the really cool stuff with the, with the uh, LLM models, right? Where you can basically chat to the data and have a conversation. And, then, and I mean, that, that's perfect for all the technical skill gaps, whereas like end users can just have a conversation like, which hotel in Bangkok's got the best Wi-Fi? What do I need to do here? Or we can tell them. Um, and all of that rules can be built in, um, which is, I mean, that's that's like one of the biggest game changers uh, out there, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, just get like, the, our AI is going to have kind of like local and global knowledge of the network, right? So not only is it going to have all of the parameters around your environment, your internet connection, but it's also going to have knowledge of what's happening on the network. So it's going to be able to tell you the problems here, the problems there, you need to do this. And uh, and likewise on, on the, for the telcos and stuff like that, right? It's, uh, it's taking the technician out of the loop and also take, I mean, going to do me out of a job on the consultancy side, but um, <laughs> It's, um, you know, it's, it's just so much value for that. So there's, yeah, I mean, there's, but then also we're going to look at AI in other ways as well for like um, making sure the data is valid. Um, there's no kind of like um, silly games being played across the network, people trying to interfere with nodes and stuff like that. We can detect, use AI to detect, um, you know, strange results and things like that and, and block nodes and things. 
Yeah, and one one question I've been meaning to ask. I mean, I sort of already asked it. And before I do, everybody, a reminder to like and subscribe and leave comments below for yes. Keith or us, who you want to see next, feedback, everything, etc. And yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask because we Sasha and I always laugh about this. I think we've laughed about it in some of our advisory calls too. How many deep in projects are launching? How did this become a narrative? And what percentage of these are actually decentralized <laughs> or have physical infrastructure? <laughs> but what's your take on this yeah. third sort of narrative right now that's going on still? Like, yeah, I, I, didn't I mean, that. so I mean. If you go with their narrative, everything that uses a mobile app is deep in, right? You know, so <laughs> Facebook's deep in, YouTube's deep in, everything's deep in, right? Which is like, you know, in AI, I mean, in and, AI and, and the other thing is like the what I struggle to understand with some of the other deep ins is like they're trying to put a decentralized layer on something that already exists, right? You know, so that means like you're not adding anything new, you're just adding another kind of gateway, another layer, right? And it, in some instances, it makes it a bit, um, you know, a, a bit easier for consumers if they can use one service when they're, they're roaming around and stuff like that. Um, so that's one thing, but you see some really obscure use cases where they're just clutching at straws to get any value and, and things. and. Uh, I mean, this is what a lot of the, the kind of deep in people, like the supply side is easy. You're always going to be able to get people to download an app to, to run a node, but it's how do you monetize that? How do you get real value of, it, of that? And that's something that we've spent years going around in circles. And, uh, you know, like traditionally telecom monitoring is not something that's sexy, right? You know, it's not something. So we've, got, we've had to really think about, you know, like how, how can we make it more consumer focused? How can we really solve those problems for the users? When look, we've never felt pain like we have now when we're not on the internet, right? And there's so many people that haven't even got on the internet yet and have thought that kind of value and you know just solving that big problem with those struggling to deliver the quality, just solve the problems for them, right? And that's where we're trying to uh, to focus on. Yeah, that's a good point. Like it, it's not sexy at all, but at the same time, everybody needs internet. It's probably one of the most yeah. important piece of infrastructure we have in the planet. So maybe it's just finally catching up. Maybe that's why Deepin is taking over. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is like the internet's become more decentralized, right? You know, you've got these other Deepin apps that are actually extended on from your telco. Um, you know, how's their quality of service? How's their customer experience? Like when their networks goes down, it's just another layer, right? And this, I mean, this is where Qualo comes in as well. We cover every network, every technology, it doesn't matter if you're a deep in Wi-Fi network, if you're Starlink, a satellite 5G, like our networks, technology agnostic, right? Because it connects the same way as we connect, right? You connect via Wi-Fi or mobile or, or Ethernet connection order. So that's, and we, we want to make sure that we're the one network for making sure all the other networks work properly. Yeah, and also that, that reminded me to another question you you've been essentially trying to raise funds in a bear market uh, that's when you first started and then you had to retool go back to the drawing board now it's a little bit easier and there's this huge temptation we've seen from founders to like we said insert ai insert rwas insert deep in yeah. into the pitch deck jam it in there because you feel this pressure to raise money to build your team and to to actually honor the vision of what you set out to build so what has been like the biggest takeaway from fundraising, the biggest pain points, the biggest, like we, we have founders yeah. that are trying to build their own companies out there. What, what can you like share with them that might help them in their journey to raise funds? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's like, um, you know, we had something that was very technical solution and, you know, yeah. the problems like inside Telco and, and just how big it is, it's not something that's commonly known, right? Just how, how big an issue it is. So we, it's really hard to get that message across, you know, so we early on, we took a um, bit of a jump to make an explainer video that really sum, summarizes it up. So that, that helped a lot, but also, I mean, working with you guys really helped with that, you know, with your experience, how do we simplify the messaging? How do we get the value out there? And, um, you know, and I think also the other difficult thing is like our projects so out there compared to everything else on the market, like there's not, you know, like it takes <laughs> takes a lot to get your head around it. And that was the other, I mean, when we come off the back of the accelerator with uh, in mind, it's like having access to you guys where, you know, I think Sasha met with Nick and uh, Brian in the early days where you had hours in the, in the coffee shop going <laughs> over it. And like, you don't have 
access to to VCs and investors, um, but, you know that level of access is like five minute pitch, ten minute pitch. You've got to try and throw out whatever mm. you uh, whatever you can to get in there. So that's that's also a huge pressure. And then also like um, coming from an engineering background, you've got to like re-engineer yourself a bit to get used to like public speaking, how to market yourself, how to you know do these sort of presentations and pitches where you know I've been used to. The really long, boring, you know, <laughs> telecom pitches to like CEOs or whatever, right? You know, not pitching uh, solutions and things like that. So, and I guess the other thing is, I like, trust the process, right? It's if you believe something is important and worth doing, like you know, you've got to go all in, and that's like a big thing for us. Is like um, the last year we've been all in, right? And that you can't have distractions and it's painful, you can, you know, cause you've got no revenues, you've got no salary coming in, but you just got to stay on track and, you know, find other co-founders who, who can be a cheerleader and bring, you know, unique skills to the, to the table, you know, and, and go on. I mean, those have been the, um, the biggest takeaways and, and also letting, letting other people do, do things, right. You know, don't try, don't try to own everything yourself. Let, mm-hmm people run with it and, uh, you know, try to be more of a leader. And that's kind of been a bit of a process as well to go from uh, someone who's kind of like, you know, just contributing engineering to actually trying to run things. And, you know, it's my baby, it's my vision. I have to step up and go with it. Right. And it's just something you've got to do and trust the process. You'll get around to it and uh, keep on, keep on going. Mm. And uh, I mean, yeah. it's like led to this point now where, you know, so many exciting things are happening that um, yeah, I mean, it's excited for for the for the next few months. Yeah, it's a it's almost like uh, art or music in a way. Like once once it's it's put out there, it's no longer yours, and so you have to like yeah. just go along for the ride, trust the process, uh, enjoy the journey. But it's been again um, so amazing watching you guys grow as founders over the past year that we've been yeah. working together. Because as a founder, as a person that is creating a company in a startup landscape, especially in tech, especially in Web3, where things move at light speed, you have exposure to a million different challenges and problems um, it, within a year, you know. And so it's it's incredible watching you guys grow and grow. And it's, it's lovely. And I know you guys have been building Qualu for a long time. Like we said, before Deepin became Deepin, you guys were Deepin. And so it's yeah. something that we actually <laughs> tell many other people. But the yeah. interesting thing is seeing you guys like not only grow as a, as a company, a team, but also grow the business. And so we're, you know, we're talking about fundraising. You guys are, you know, just started kicking off the fundraise um, yeah. and making some great progress already. But yeah. You know, you've expanded the global Qualu network quite a bit. You've got this global map that I've seen as far as like a coverage map. You've got case histories. You've got business. You've got some revenue coming in. And so it's almost like we're fundraising to speed this along. But you guys have built so much on your own already. And it's just it's testament to the fact that you guys have grown and you guys have become more resourceful and you've understood how to solve these challenges. So just seem to say yeah. like, it's been a pleasure working with y'all, honestly. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and likewise, thanks to you guys. I mean, it's having people with your kind of expertise to believe in us and cultures along the way. And, and you know, that having that support network is, uh, is you know, it means everything. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, it's for us, it's a labor of love, right? We're, we're all in, we are like, <laughs> You know, we've got Kualu coming out of our ears, right? You know, and, to us. <laughs> and it's, yeah, I mean, after these, I mean, the amount of conversations we've had go around thrashing this out, what we're going to do, how we're going to do, and to, to land into the, the Web3, the token, and, 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 and to get things moving. And now we've got sort of like investors coming on board and we've had like, you know, loyal friends and family that have been chipping in. Uh, you know, to see the excitement building in them is is also good, right? Because it's it's a team effort, right? Of, uh, of yeah. all of us, right? The team, investors, and uh, you know, once this is open to the public over the coming months, like you know, it's going to be exciting to see that that map grow globally. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, we got to wrap it up, but before we do, again, if you guys are enjoying this content, like, maybe uh, throw us a subscribe. We got more interesting 
Boom Room exclusive interviews coming. Make sure you check out the show notes. We've got all the links to Qualu and how you can reach out to them and just follow awesome. what they're doing uh, underneath the video here. And before we wrap it up, we're going to ask you a question that we ask everyone that we have on uh, the Boom Room. Um, and there's only one simple rule. So uh, what are you the most bullish on in crypto? And it can be a person, place, <laughs> thing, or asset, but it just can't be Qualu. Or deep in. No deep in. <laughs> Bad. Oh, man. I mean, I guess it all Please comes back. <laughs> Yeah, way too much time spent on mean coins, but uh, yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, seeing the Bitcoin dominate and just keep coming back is like as the Godfather is just awesome, right? And uh, I think that's key. I mean, I know it's easy to get distracted with all these uh, altcoins and stuff like that, but you know, just to see Bitcoin raging and doing well and growing, I think that's you know that's great. So I'm, I'm keeping up topping up that Bitcoin when I get a chance. <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin yeah. Max, that's awesome. Yeah, and QXT, the next one. Yeah, don't fade Qualu. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's coming, y'all. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Keith, so thank nice. you so be fun. much. I yeah, really thanks, appreciate. Guys. Yeah, really yeah. appreciate you taking the time talking about Qualu, your journey. It's been always such a pleasure. A hour. Yeah. And uh, again, we wish you the best of luck with everything. It's been wonderful working with you guys on this journey. Awesome. And again, thanks to all of our viewers for watching. Again, Throw us a like, subscribe, follow us, check out our Telegram community where Qualu uh, is sometimes joining in and contributing to the conversation. A lot of fun stuff happening. Yeah. And uh, stay safe out there. Until then, ciao, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.